knocked off two ranked teams in the same season. And it's over for the first time in 41 years. James Madison advances to the second round of the NCAA tournament. We've got ourselves a tournament, darling, and it's the Dukes that will play Duke for a chance to move on to the Sweet 16. Heard such a well-deserved energy, aggressiveness, belief in the James Madison. They did it. Folks, you're muted. You're muted. But, but gosh, I can imagine your excitement here. <laughs> As we come into another episode of the JMU Sports News Podcast, the Dukes beat Wisconsin men's basketball going to the round of 32 for the first time in uh, four decades. It was an insane game, too. Not only did they beat the Wisconsin Badgers, they thoroughly dominated the Wisconsin Badgers. Friedel hits a three to open the game, and they trailed the entire I mean, sorry, lead the entire game. Wisconsin trailed the entire time. You're yes. right. And that was one of Friedel's two made threes. The other one was also just a massively clutch bucket later in the game that like flipped the momentum on its head. The Dukes, I, I, maybe this isn't as crazy as I think it is, right? But to me, it's wild that the Dukes had withstood two 8 1 runs, one in the first half, one in the second half, and won the game by 11. Yeah, Klesman caught fire in the second half. I think he scored all his points in the second half. He had five. If you told me that he hit five second half threes, that Wooden was, or sorry, not Wooden, Edwards, I think was five of 13 from the floor. All right. Cool, Bennett. Jamie Sports News Podcast. It's. You know, it's becoming a regular thing. It, it, shout out Bennett's Wi-Fi. It really struggles. Uh, before we dive into all of that, uh, we can break down some, some advertisements while Bennett is frozen. The tournament is here. Bet Online is your bracket headquarter for this season with the best bracket contests out there. Odds, lines, info, every game, every round, right up until the national championship. You can access the most up-to-the-minute wagering information anytime from your desktop or mobile device and even track your bracket real-time all the way through the tournament. Uh, head to Bet Online today and get in on the action. Remember to use promo code BELIEVE, that's promo code B-L-E-A-V, for a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet Online, where the game starts. There's a reason Christopher William Jewelers has been voted best of Virginia year after year. It's not just one thing that sets us apart. It's everything. It's the selection, extensive and unmatched, with every engagement ring, loose diamond, and fashion jewelry chosen for quality and brilliance. It's the service. From our diamond experts to our master goldsmith, our team shares a passion for what they do, and it shows. It's the atmosphere, both glamorous and laid back. See for yourself why people can't stop talking about Christopher William Jewelers in Harrisonburg and Weird cave back Better back and loaded got the hot spot we're ready to go but i'm just i'm shocked man they they weren't that great offensively and they beat wisconsin by 11 points it's i think at this point is it the greatest men's basketball team in program history yes like i, I don't think that's a i don't think that's a far maybe i'm being prisoner of the moment and i don't remember you know the 1974 version of the dukes but I don't think it's insane to say that this is the best JMU men's basketball team that they've ever fielded. I think it's right up there, right? And your only debates would be sort of those early 80 teams that were pretty good in both. I think they won NCAA tournament games in 81, 82, and 83. But those teams also didn't win 32 games. Again, the schedule's different, right? But 32 wins. They have wins over Michigan State and Wisconsin now. They're going up against Duke. Uh, tomorrow with a chance to move into the Sweet 16 for the first time in program history. I guess we'll start with the Wisconsin game, but I thought it was their best defensive performance of the year by far. Yeah, I mean, they shot 29%. They shot 29% from behind the arc. You were saying it before you froze earlier. If you had told me that Terrence was 5 for 13, Klesman hit five, three, thir five, th five second half threes, Take everything put together and the Duke shot 29%. I'd be like, oh, we lost by 20. 
like a good season. What? But no, they won by 11. The defense did something to Wisconsin that Wisconsin hasn't done all year, a season high in turnovers. The, the Duke's defense was active. They were everywhere. They were pestering the Badgers every single time. Whoever touched the ball off the ball, Wisconsin was getting no clean runs. I mean, it was absolutely perfect defense from JMU. And I was having this conversation at the uh, Charlotte watch party with a few people there where we held Michigan State to go one for 20 to start the season. Is that a little bit of luck? Probably. But throughout this entire season, it seems like we keep coming back to this thing. We're like, we're like, ah, JMU's defense isn't actually that good. We just so happen to get these teams on their worst nights type of thing, where it's just like you, you never fully realize how good their defense is. And last night I was watching the game and I was like, this defense is is very good. It's not a thing of like, oh, they don't match up well. Wisconsin doesn't turn the ball over, so JMU's defense won't get turnovers. Watching the game last night made me realize, no, the defense is so good that they will put their will into you. So if they want to turn you over, JMU's defense, doesn't matter what you've done all season, will turn you over. Yeah, they forced a season high. I think it was 19 for Wisconsin. Unbelievable start to the game where they just forced a ton of turnovers. They're really athletic. I think that was something that I listen to right to like the occasional Wisconsin podcast. I think people, when you don't watch JMU and you haven't watched them all season, you look at basically just the the depth chart and you're like, Bickerstaff 6'9", like that's your size. And then you watch them play. It's like, well, they're incredibly fast. They're really long. Bickerstaff's really good down low. Carey's been holding his own down low. They're good defensively because they have guys like Horton who play and, and Edwards, I think, who play above their size, what Friedel does too, where they like the way they look, they have good length, they're active, they're really aggressive. Uh, they're more physical. Tyler Wall hit the deck like five times in the first two minutes and just didn't seem like he was quite ready for that. If you would switch the jerseys, right, and told everyone, both for this game and the Michigan State game, that JMU was the Big Ten team, I think everybody would believe you. It was insane. Just like, a perfect performance. Noah hits two threes. Michael Green hits two threes. And they don't particularly shoot it well from beyond the arc. Like I said, 29% from three. On the game, they shot at just a 41% clip. They still hung up 72 points on a Wisconsin team that is very, very good. They beat them by 11. Like I said earlier, they withstood two different 8-1 runs in the first half, one in the second half. And it's just like they did so many things wrong and won the game. And they also did so many things right. Like defensively, it, like you said, it was the perfect game. Offensively, you're watching that game and you're like, there's so much potential here still. Like, is it crazy to say that they still haven't played a full game? They still haven't played a full 40 minutes of great basketball. And with that being said, they've lost three times this season, twice to the same team, which is a nightmare matchup for them, including a win over a Big Ten team at their place and now a win over a Big Ten team in the tournament, I think there are high hopes for this game against Duke. Call me crazy, but like plus six is what I saw most recently on Bet Online and DraftKings. I love that value. I think it's going to be a tight game. I think that one's got a chance to be to be awesome. But I mean, just they didn't play that well offensively. Like they took a decent yeah. dip in Ken Palm with their offensive rating. They averaged less than a point per possession. Right, sub 30% from three. They missed nine free throws. They're 21 of 30. We also talked about, or at least I did, about how Wisconsin's really good at defending without fouling. Maybe they're not because they went to the line a ton, JMU did. They were drawing a ton of fouls because they were so aggressive toward the rim. And I think there are a few early in the game that weren't called that probably could have been where Bickerstaff and some others went to the rim really hard. But, I mean, they shot less than 50% from two. They didn't shoot well at all. And they had Wisconsin at arm's length the entire game. Just... Such an incredible performance. I thought there might be some nerves or some jitters, and they just stomped on Wisconsin's throat in the first five minutes. It was really, it was special. It was so great. Watching that game, what was your, what were your emotions? I was kind of, so like the Michigan State game was, I mean, Jamie got off to a great start, and they had the halftime lead, and then they kind of gave it away, which we sort of expected, right, going into the year. We're like, we think they're good, but they're maybe not that good. And they gave it away, and I was like, all right, well, close loss, good for them. Then they rallied and won an OT. I thought this could have a similar flow where it would be like, okay, okay they're up early. Wisconsin's going to make a second-half push. They did a little bit, 
but I thought they might tie it or take a lead and Jamie would have to have another push of their own. <laughs> they just kept them away the whole time. And then with five minutes left, it was like, whoa, they, they just did that. Like, that's insane. It was like, oh, unbelievable. Like the Michael Green miss layup. Any other game this season, I would have been like, that lost them the game. But in this game, it was a miss layup, a three on the other end. And then you look at the score and you're like, oh, they're still up 12. And Wisconsin so, hasn't had an offensive rhythm all night. And it's not like it's starting now with three minutes left. And they're great offensively. Like Wisconsin is a really, really efficient good offensive basketball team. They're not always the best from three, but like Klesman can hit them. They shut down store for the most part. I thought he was completely out of rhythm. Crowell, I think sometimes they were really physical on him that sort of threw him out of his game. Tyler Wall looked like a complete non-factor. I thought Wooden, there were a couple times where I expected Wall to like body Wooden or be more physical. Wooden had a couple plays where he caught it at the three-point line and barreled into his chest and then scored at the rim. And I was like, Oh my God. <laughs> I mean, They're ready to go. AJ store was a non-factor. Yeah. You, you mentioned Crowell, the seven footer, I think kind like got like five points in the first half. And other than that, I don't remember, like he probably finished with more points, but like he was outside of a three and then just a wide open dunk for him. He never really made a play that I can like distinctly remember. Yeah, Chucky Hepburn couldn't get anything going. And it was, I mean, it's just fascinating, right? Because, like, Brown for JMU was not shooting well. He obviously was incredible in the, the Sun Belt Championship. Didn't have a great game. Uh, Friedel missed a few, had some really clutch shots. But what probably wasn't his best shooting game either. Horton missed some. Like they, it was no Edwards, one's good. No one was good shooting the ball in this game. And like they won by 11. Maybe. Wooden and Bakerstaff, like, reasonably. But, yeah, I know. It's like to win like that when they don't have an offensive performance that was great was – it says a lot about this team. And I also think we saw it a couple times this year, and I think we probably didn't focus on this enough of how easy it is to go through the motions when you're playing on the road against, like, Marshall and you're already up 20, and they just like, okay, we did it, and they're kind of in that <laughs> Which zone. we saw a lot of near the end of the season. <laughs> <laughs> to see them – fully locked in, which I think we saw in the Sunbelt championship game, especially where they were incredible. Yeah. We saw it in the second half of that Georgia Southern game where they were down and they're like, Oh, we got to flip a switch. And in this game with an incredible crowd, which we haven't even mentioned yet, they just played with an energy level that you can't recreate in like mid February on the road against a bad team. But when they play that engaged, they can make up for bad shooting. So if they have a good shooting game, it could, it could be a deep run. So I'm going to sprinkle these in throughout, just kind of bringing up, uh, remember the overreaction corner we had during football season? Yes. I kind of retroactively fit it to fit kind of what your emotion, if you wanted to drop an overreaction, uh, by all means, you could have <laughs> dropped an overreaction. Um, <laughs> Sweet. Uh, so, some people did, but I'm going to sprinkle in the answers throughout because what this game meant for like the community of JMU fans was absolutely crazy because watching the game, we'll get to the crowd in a second, but watching that game, texting you, texting Dom, texting Brian this morning because he was actually there, like texting everyone, just like what that game meant. I couldn't be like, I tweeted it. I was talking to everyone at the, the, the watch party at, in Charlotte that would listen to me. This team won nine games. In 2019, 2020, they, that was not that long ago. And they are now winning NCAA tournament games. And now there's reason to believe that the Dukes can beat Duke. So this is from Daniel Merriman. Drop your, your emotions, your, your feelings, your thoughts, your overreactions. Uh, Daniel Merriman, if JMU hits their shots, Duke is going down. Am I crazy for thinking Elite Eight isn't unfathomable? And then he said Houston's terrifying. Houston is terrifying, but hey, A and M look pretty good. They gotta, they gotta get through that first. <laughs> they gotta get through Duke first. Yeah, the Dukes have to do, <laughs> do their own <laughs> stuff too. But, um, but the 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 fans in attendance at Barclays Center wow. made the trip to Brooklyn. Not only was it a majority purple in the stands, then also like. The game before, I don't know if JMU fans just swapped places with Duke, but like it looked like 
in the second session with the Dukes playing that everyone was either a fan of JMU or Wisconsin. Like there was no, it didn't look like there was a lot of holdovers from that earlier game. You know what I mean? Am I making sense? Atmosphere. Like it was, it was insane. The the you energy did, that was. You broke up yeah. a little bit there. All we heard was atmosphere. It was an electric atmosphere. Okay. This is the best atmosphere that they played in in such a long time. Obviously, they when was their last home game? Their last home game was on February 17th. So over a month ago. So for them to play with like fans who are actually supporting them, and obviously they had some in Pensacola, but not nearly to the extent that we were in Brooklyn. And really cool, but also really cool to see people like John Fanta and others be like, wow, they, they really traveled well. It's like, well, yeah, it's not like an, a school with like 3,000 undergrad. Right. There's a lot of people that attend the school who care. Yes. Like passionate fans, a lot of them. And it's, I think the fan base is growing a lot because partially because the football team has been absolutely cooking. <laughs> um, but then also because, right, basketball is good now and they, they want to cheer for that. I don't know. It's like there's a lot of JMU fans that are, are willing to go to games. It's a school that, right, they're a mid major, but you look at some of the other, like mid major teams or something. And it's not, you know, it's not Yale. Like I think athletics are more important to the university than a lot of other mid majors. Yeah. Which is evidenced by that sport of copies <laughs> blasting JMU. Yeah. That's why the students have to <laughs> pay the whole bill. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I also, I also love your internet right now. Just being so janky that you this is just cut out of your two seconds. You're, no, you're coming through, but your face doesn't match your words. So your sick. Your That's video sick. is about 15 seconds behind your voice. So it's it's very funny. This is Chris. If JMU plays defense like they did last night, they're a final four team. An insane home atmosphere. That Barclays, that was that was that was the bank north. Very also, cool to watch. Grandma Peggy. If JMU, do you understand how Grandma Peggy can will grip the nation if they beat Duke tomorrow? That's Friedel's grandmother. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> was there? I, I guess there was that clip. I didn't watch the clip of him talking about Grandma Peggy. Uh, Are there images of him with Grandma Peggy that have been surfaced, or is it just the? I don't think images of him with Grandma Peggy, but they. Uh, that, well, I think the video of Fanta. When he turns around and like uh, she's there, you see her standing and cheering, going, getting really into it because she's like, "Yeah, well, you're right. right. They're one win away from Grandma Peggy being a national story." <laughs> like, because you have to watch the clip because it's really funny. Because John Fanta also, I don't know how he knows these things. This is the most plugged in guy for Noah's every team in there. the nation. He was just like, "I heard Grandma Peggy came," and then Noah's answer is essentially like, "Yeah, she was kind of hoping for Omaha, but." She, she'll come anywhere and uh, she's old and she flew out and was enjoying Brooklyn. I think whoever was in the locker next to him was like, yeah, we love grandma Peggy. Apparently she, so Peggy is a, a treasure and I'm, I can't wait if the JMU Dukes beat the Duke blue devils. I cannot wait for the grandma Peggy news cycle. Yeah, that's big. Friedel was huge. Also that, I guess that one sequence where Klesman goes in for an uncontested layup where he took what seemed to be like four or five steps, puts it up, hangs on the rim forever, misses it when they're making a run, go back out. Fredell bangs a three and the game's basically over at that point. They never, never rallied. He's clutch, man. He's hit some big ones. Horton's been clutch this year. They've got some guys outside of Edwards and Bickerstaff that are just, they like the bright lights, which is kind of rare when you're a <laughs> Sunbelt team. It is insane. Michael Green gets up in for the moment. Noah Friedel does. Uh, Xavier Brown definitely does. I love Xavier like Brown. Oh, he loves the moment. He he hit a couple Some, big. Sometimes a little too much, but <laughs> yeah, it's debatable. He had a couple big uh, like mid range jumpers in the yeah. second half. Yeah, he, he had a couple badly th badly taken. He definitely threes. tried another like logo three. <laughs> There was when he left his hands, I was like, what are we doing, Xavier? And then like the very next play, he's dribbling through the lane and like just loses yeah. possession. And it's just like, okay, let's not do this. But then it clearly it didn't matter. That was when we were still worried about the outcome of the game. I like that Byington gives them so much freedom though. Like they make some some head scratching plays at times, but they also have so much confidence. 
Um, I think largely because they're allowed to do that. Like they're allowed to make mistakes in practice and then in the game and still be trusted, which is really cool. I heard through the grapevine that the way that coach Byington does like film review and like grade your game is off of if you had a good shot, did you take it? And if you didn't have a good shot, did you make the right pass? And like, those are the two criteria he does. I like that. Where, like his coaching philosophy is if you have a shot, take it. That, which I think makes sense for them. I don't know. I think, yeah. I guess we should talk Duke a little bit. I think they're going to come out and shoot a lot better than they did against Wisconsin. Yeah. Looking at Duke three notched weekly preview, de facto weekly preview that's within 24 hours. If JMU regresses to the mean and they take a slight step down defensively, I don't think it's outside the realm of possibility to beat Duke. I think if they played the game they played last night, they could beat Duke. I, I think the Blue Devils are a beatable team. You saw Vermont hang with them for three quarters of that game. And I would say that JMU is a lot better than Vermont. I'll start. Talking with a friend of mine, Paul, he said, I think Duke, I think JMU is 13 points better than Vermont. Yeah. Or whatever I think it's Vermont gonna, lost by. I think it's going to be a competitive game. I think there's still going to be a lot of purple in attendance. Obviously, Duke fans are kind of like nationwide, right? Because it's just like a, people attend, but you've also got it's a gigantic bandwagon. <laughs> fan Lakers, base as well. La if, yeah. if, you, if you like Dukes, you like the Lakers, <laughs> the Yankees, and the Patriots or Cowboys, Cowboys or Chiefs. Yeah. <laughs> That's incredibly accurate. <laughs> so, I mean, you've, you've got a lot of Duke fans that are going to be there, but I think there will be some purple there. I think the thing that concerns me maybe is I think there have been times this year that we've talked about at a decent amount where JMU on some of those Thursday games was absolutely cooking. And then you got them in a Saturday game and it was like, did they, did they game plan for that team? So I'm interested to see how that goes with just the one day of rest. Also, yeah. obviously for Duke, right. Beating Vermont. I can't imagine was too emotional. I don't think that was too meaningful for that program. <laughs> beating Wisconsin for JMU was a huge deal. It was the later game. They're doing a ton of media after that. My guess is it was probably pretty hard to fall asleep after. They probably just fell asleep. Yeah. So like the rest could be a little bit weird. I guess you've got at least some time to sleep on Sunday too with the game at 515 on CBS. But if they play with the energy they played against Wisconsin with and they shoot a little better, it could be a game. Could be it could be a really fun game. I mean, we'll talk the X's and O's a little bit, but uh, another another reaction. I love this team's makeup all year. My biggest concern was our defensive intensity. And then we can go through stretches where we seem not to be locked in, kind of like what we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. That's no longer an issue. In the biggest game of the year, we were locked in from the jump and dominated a top 20 team. I can't wait for Duke. We will beat Duke. Yeah, I'm I'm feeling good because it did seem a little bit like they flipped a switch energy-wise. What does, yes. But what really worries me about this second game is typically you see because you only have that day of rest, so – you can't really rely on a game plan as extensively as you can for that round of 64 game. So you really rely on momentum, emotions, energy, and talent. And, and I don't mean to be like Duke has five star kids and like elite level ACC guys, I'm not saying JMU, JMU definitely can compete, but it's like on paper the talent advantage just from a pure like raw talent standpoint goes Duke. I think Jamie might actually have the coaching advantage and <laughs> I'm not a big John Shire fan, but I think the Dukes have a better coaching advantage. How much can that play into a game that you're playing 36 hours after you just finished one on, on Friday? You know what I mean? Yeah, here's the here's the part that gets me excited is that they have used I would so the the most frequently used lineup uh, for Ken Palm that they've done like 45 ish percent of the time the last five games you have Jeremy Roach who's a senior point guard been around trash for a really long time right he's good but then trash. you're looking at freshman sophomore 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 last year they lost in the second round like they don't have a ton of outside of Roach like tournament experience which I think is oh, pretty I exciting. They're I didn't really... realize Filipowski was a sophomore. Yeah. He looks old. 
I imagine he would go pro soon, seven feet and can hit it from three. But like <laughs> they're young. They've got NBA guys, but they're still young. Like I think the fact that Noah Friedel has played like was he played like five college seasons? I don't know. They've been around forever. They have some old dudes where like Bigger staff has played on three teams. Some of these guys are finishing their first year of college basketball. So Duke ranks 205th in D1 experience. The average age of their players, 1.74 years that they've had college experience. JMU, 12th most experienced team in the entire nation. Their players average 3.07 years of experience. So that may come into play. They played a lot of college basketball. I just don't think they're going to be, not that they're going to be like, right, they don't have a ton of tournament experience either having the one game, but they're still, they've just been around a lot. They've had a lot of different experiences. They know that there's not really a lot to lose for them at this point, where Duke, I think, is very different. I think if you're Duke, anything less than the Sweet 16 would be a disappointment, and now you're not even playing a power conference team. Like You can get tight if you're Duke, and it's, a close game in the second half against James Madison. Good news for JMU. Duke doesn't block the ball at an exceptionally high clip. They rank 131st in the nation, blocking a shot on 10.1% of defensive possessions. So another slightly favorable matchup for JMU in terms of being able to drive into the paint and play it from there. Duke's defense, though, does rank 83rd against the three. So it'll be interesting to see how JMU builds off of a poor shooting performance specifically from three now facing off a facing off against a much better defensive team in duke especially from behind the arc duke ranks 22nd in the nation in defensive efficiency their offense is has been elite but their one thing that their offense can kind of get issues with is they can get blocked they rank near the bottom of the country getting blocked on 11.8 percent of their offensive possessions with that being said, JMU's a defense that doesn't really block a lot. They turn you over a lot, but they don't block you a lot. Also not to the same extent as Wisconsin, but Duke has not exactly been red hot to end the season. Yeah. So their last seven games, uh, including the win over Vermont, they're four and three. If you look at the matchups there, um, they played, what is it, four teams, I guess, Three teams, three teams inside the top 60 of Ken Palm. JMU's 57, so that'll be um, the fourth. Lost to Wake Forest on February 24th. They lost to North Carolina to end the season, and they split meetings with NC State, including losing to NC State, which is 54th in Ken Palm in the ACC tournament. Vermont is 105th in Ken Palm, so they're not even in the top 100. Yeah, Duke is not coming into this game exactly on a tear, which I think is exciting for a JMU team that's won 14 in a row. I'm so excited. I think it's we can winnable. Do it. It's absolutely winnable. I think Sweet 16 would so, be unbelievable, man. So the game against Wisconsin, right? Like the the this AJ Store was with Terrence at like all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. The, the, de the deciding factor, you could argue, in that game was how TJ Biggerstaff and Jalen Carey. Also, something we're not talking about that we need to talk about really quick. Is this a revenge game for Jalen Carey? Oh, with the little sibling rivalry? Well, no, not even a sibling. You had your brother play at Duke, and Duke didn't even look at you. Are you is this like an opportunity for you to maybe show them this is what you missed out on? I think that'll be a, quite a fun game for him. I'm sure he's been to some Duke games. I think that might be, I think that's a little bit of a fun storyline there. I would love to see an article. I would love to see an article talking to Vernon and talking to Jalen about uh, granted you can't get that in 36 hours. So hey, maybe, maybe, maybe post game, like a, a reaction about like what that meant to Jalen to play Duke. But what I was getting at this whole long winded way to say it was a Steven Crowell versus TJ Bickerstaff, Jalen Carey type of thing. Bickerstaff and Carey did a great job of not getting into foul trouble even with bigger staff being called for a ticky tack foul, like 30 seconds into the yeah. game that got him sitting down. Carey performed admirably this game. I think guard wise, everything else, JMU matches up exceptionally well. Kyle Filipowski, another seven footer who can step out and hit threes. And he's, he's a, a much, he's much better than Crowell. And he's athletic. 
Like he's got better feet than Crow. Crow's just yeah. a big dude. Filipowski matches TJ Bickerstaff in athleticism and then also is seven foot and can step out. It's a real shame the Sun Belt doesn't have guys like Kyle Filipowski, so they can kind of get used to it throughout the season. Be but huge uh, <laughs> for the league if they can get some Filipowski. Uh I, that that matchup, how do they how do they deal with Filipowski? Does he get doubled when he gets the entry pass? Does he how do you play it? And I think that's going to decide the game. If JMU wins, Filipowski won't score more than 15 points. If Duke wins, Filipowski will score 20 plus. It's going to be a fun, really fun matchup in the post. They got Filipowski and then Mark Mitchell are both big dudes. Outside of that, uh, Ryan Young will come in off the bench. They're not the not the biggest, so I think it'll be interesting. JMU's like wings and guards, I think, can match up decently well. But similarly to Wisconsin, uh, a bit of a different tempo, certainly, for Duke, where they, they play a lot faster offensively than Wisconsin does. Uh, but they don't turn it over a lot, so can JMU continue to – to create havoc on really talented guards. They did against Wisconsin. If they can do it again, it'll be interesting. But you could have a little bit of a worse defensive performance and make up for it if you can knock down some threes. Yeah. A few more of these overreaction, reaction types of things. This is from W. Excelsior. The Dukes would go undefeated in the Big Ten. So far, so good. They're 2-0. and oh. Sample size, yeah, project that out. Don Palumbo, this man wrote a freaking paragraph, if not more. <laughs> Jesus. <sighs> All right, get buckle in, folks. This is a long one. This was an inc- such an incredible moment. I think it's easy at times for a small number of people to say we should be striving for this all the time or seeking to make a massive run in this tournament as an expectation. But it made me so happy to see every corner of JMU Nation relishing in this and realizing moments like Friday don't always happen and aren't even expected within a number of power conference programs. Sharing the conversation, the win, and the coverage with so many friends from college was amazing. College athletics, even in an era when it's crumbling in front of us, is still, Jesus Christ, is still (laughs) able to bring us, is still able to bring so many regular people together, and last night provided such visceral proof of that. We all love JMU, and it's clear everyone within this program does too, even if they may not all be back here next year. Coaches and players alike, what an amazing evening. That was both so heartfelt and so sad at the same time. Moonski on YouTube commented, uh, Bickerstaff did play against Filipowski last year at Boston College. Oh, we like that. We like that. Somebody's <laughs> going to go look and see how that went. <laughs> All right. Well, while you do that, I'm going to I'm gonna keep – that means he also knows Filipowski tendencies at least a little bit. Like this isn't the first time. He scouted him, yeah. Yeah. Um, roll motherfucking Ooh. Dukes, final four bound, baby. Um the fact that we shot the three poorly and still won by double digits gives me confidence that we could win on Sunday by a good amount. My only complaints are that it didn't feel like our bigs were aggressive as they could have been in the post and free throw shooting was abysmal. That's been the case all year with free throw shooting. If we actually make our open shots and knock down threes, Duke could be in trouble. Uh, Amy, on cloud nine, happy for the team I've watched all season and never been prouder to be an alum. It's so wonderful and about time to see JMU get all this intention on a national stage. Worried Coach B will be poached. Truly going to miss Jeff Bourne. And the final one is from Joey Needham. Was in the Barclays Center and we took over the place. Chants of JMU were echoing throughout the arena. And we looked like the power conference team from the start. Completely dog walked them for 40 minutes. The defensive intensity was through the roof. And Wisconsin never got comfortable enough to run their sets. Duke will be a challenge. And everything's icing on the cake at this point. But we have a shot. That's a great way to put it. That's very well said. All right. I I have have a big scouting report for the Blue Devils that I have to go grab. I think you'll really enjoy it. While I'm gone, let me know how how did TJ do against uh, Philip. Yeah, I'm going to talk about Bakerstaff here for for quite a while. All right. So TJ Bakerstaff played against Duke last season. This is a game that Boston College lost. They lost 65 to 64 in Boston. So pretty competitive for a Boston College team that's really not expected to hang with Duke. But they did. Bad Boston College only lost by a point at home. Bickerstaff played 20 minutes, did not score, but he had four rebounds. Like that. <laughs> four rebounds, two steals, and I think of note, and I think Quentin Post was probably also a part of this because he's seven feet and 250 pounds, so I imagine he was involved in the defense. Uh, but <laughs> Filipowski, 5 of 12 from 2, 0 of 2 from 3, five turnovers in the game. 
just Baker staffs put him in a blender, and I haven't watched this. Put him in a blender. One board. Phil Pascal only had one board too. I'm seeing, I'm seeing nine rebounds. Daniel Merriman, what are you doing? I'm not sure where he's looking on that. I'm seeing a nine <laughs> rebound performance. <laughs> <laughs> fact check, fact check. There, somebody fact check. <laughs> okay, you want to know the scouting report I have ready? Yeah. <laughs> Duke's man. <mayonnaise. laughs> <laughs> the Dukes are gonna win. Yeah, the Dukes. Dukes. Because it's Duke's mayonnaise. It's not Duke mayonnaise, right? right Dukes right. are gonna win tomorrow. That's the scouting report. Wow. Yeah, like, JMU. That's true of most JMU games, which I like. But Duke versus Dukes. <laughs> Sponsored it's be by such Duke's a fun mayonnaise. One. It's gonna be such a fun one. <sighs> Nothing to lose. Yeah. You want to get up on out of here? Well, do you think they win? Oh, we got to do score prediction. JMU. What was all of our score predictions? Did any of us have a, have us winning by eleven? No, I ended up going with Wisconsin in part to be a reverse jinx. <laughs> you, I'm, thank you for <laughs> thank you for falling on that sword. Yeah, I, I kind of feel like I deserve credit for the win. <laughs> no, I think we had smaller margins. Everybody thought it'd be. Good. I had them winning seventy eight seventy. Daniel was 81-76, and Ben was 78-73. Yeah, none of us had double-digit wins. I think JMU is going to beat Duke. I think – yeah, drop your final score predictions in the comments now. Yeah. Let's see who, who does it. <laughs> now. <laughs> that, that came out aggressively. <laughs> drop your comment. Drop your score prediction in the comment. I'm going to go with JMU. 79 Duke 78. Oh, I'll, you know, I'll keep biting this bullet. I'll say Duke 77, JMU 73. I don't think there's any way the Dukes can do that. I mean, it would, it would be embarrassing for Duke to lose to the Dukes. That can't happen, right? <laughs> Thank you for falling on your sword again. It'd also be embarrassing for, you know, Duke to lose their last home game of the Coach K Air 08. It would be a real shame for Duke to lose in the final four to UNC in the final year of Coach K. Oh, wait. I think Duke just knows how to lose really bad games. We got Ben Hofer, JMU 75, Duke 12, Tim Craig, <laughs> JMU 77, Duke 74, Brad Saylor, JMU 81, Duke 76. God, I hope we come out with our, with our energy that we had against Wisconsin. If we came out like that and then also hit the shots – we we probably could have beat Wisconsin. Maybe should have beat them by like twenty. The way they right. played defensively, that like you hit some shots, that's a twenty point beat down. But all right, anything else you got to have before we get up on out of here? No, I'm looking forward to it. It should be a great great Sunday evening. Yeah, thankfully this game won't end at one a.m. Might have to jump on an emergency pod post game or something like that. Yeah, I was extremely if we tired. Won. I was so tired last. I was also pretty intoxicated. I woke up this morning at like eight and then was like, uh, and fell asleep for like three more hours. <laughs> I woke up and I was like, they really did it. And I was reading through my text from last night. I was texting Eva and it was just a string of, we did it. We did it. We won. They did it. <laughs> and I was like, wow, I was really happy. And also I wouldn't have ever dreamed, like even in my wildest imagination of like, that they would do goes that to well. Wisconsin. Everything. Oh yeah. Incredible. Everything goes well. I thought they would have won by like six. They killed them. Everything they, they didn't trail the whole game. I wouldn't have even dreamed of that happening. But the whole game. So good. But for Bennett Conlon, I'm Jack Fitzpatrick. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Jamie Sports News Podcast presented by Bet Online. Be sure to like, rate, subscribe wherever you're listening. Uh, throw us a five star, throw us a review. We'd really, really appreciate that. And you can check out all of our happenings over on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram. We're JMU Sports News there. We're JMU Sports News everywhere, including our home on the web, jmusportsnews.com. We'll be back with more. The Dukes may be Breaking news. Four seed Kansas is going to lose, folks. Four seeds. Are they cursed? <laughs> Jeez Louise. All right. And that's how this one's going to end. Y'all have a wonderful rest of your day.